As I looked over the congregation at 8.30, I did a quick count. I counted 61 people wearing glasses. And I know, I know there were some in the family that were cheating. They had contacts in. Only after I had cataract surgery did I realize why everyone in my car had been screaming while I drove. <laughs> you remember when we were kids, we would swim and, and it would get cloudy, you know, from the chlorine? That's the way it was, and I didn't know it, you know, and it was just really cloudy. And after I got the, the lenses put in, everything looked so clean and crisp. But it took me back to my childhood. Uh, I, I've worn glasses most of my life. Uh, it was a music teacher that really realized that I was having vision issues. Um, I was learning to play the organ. And she realized I wasn't playing the notes. I was playing it by ear. And I would ask her to play the song a couple of times and then I would play it pretending that I was reading the notes, and I really wasn't. So she figured it out, and these things have been on my nose ever since. And bless her heart, my daughter um, got that genetic gene from me, and she had to get glasses early on, five years old, I think. <clears throat> and I remember after the glasses were put on her nose, she was amazed that traffic lights had a box around the light. She thought there was just colors hanging there, suspended in nothing. And uh, she also did not realize that trees had leaves. She thought they were just one giant blob. And then she, once she got the glasses, she could see the individual leaves on the tree. There are in the United States 1.3 million people who are blind. In South Carolina, there are 125,000 who are blind. And we have several hundred right here in Myrtle Beach. Most of you know Cynthia Lyles, our receptionist here at, at First Church, uh, is legally blind and can hear things from 20 miles away. <laughs> uh, very insightful person. I have a cousin who was born blind, no eyes, and she has a double PhD. She's worked every day of her life since she earned that last doctorate, and I can't imagine her being any more successful with two eyes that can see than she was blind. Sometimes sight can be restored, and that's happening more and more today. Several years ago, a news report detailed the story of an adult male who had his sight restored, and an interviewer kept asking him, actually badgering him, for, for uh, information about what was different. Uh, what's life like now? Tell us, what does it mean to, after all these years, suddenly have your sight again? And the fellow just kind of, uh, he, he didn't want to talk about it that much. He, he hemmed and hawed. And then finally the reporter asked, what's the most unexpected thing that you've, you've discovered since you've regained your sight? And he said, I know that leaves fall. I know that people rake them and put them in piles and burn them or throw them away. But I'd always imagined that leaves would come down just like a blanket. I didn't know that when leaves fall that they pitch and glide and turn in the wind as they come down to the ground. It's absolutely beautiful. Yes, there's blindness all around us. There is some blindness there because of choice. We don't want to see. For in seeing something, we are bound to act upon it. We are bound to do something about it. 
If we see a need, when, if we are followers of the carpenter, if we see a need, then we are bound to respond to that need. If it's somebody that's hungry, we feed them. If it's somebody who uh, is homeless, it behooves us to find them shelter. On and on and go. We just can't walk by them and be a follower of the Galilean carpenter. When we see it, you and I are called to respond. I have to admit, I have seen some beautiful things in the, in the 61 years I've been around. But there are some things that I have seen I wish I had not seen. I really do. I wish I could take my finger and go like this and blot out my mind's eye. Because it's burned right there. I remember standing in one of the largest Palestinian camps in the Middle East. Ibid is its name. And it's right there in southern Syria, west uh, Jordan, northeast Israel, just over the Golan Heights, if you can think about your Middle Eastern geography, about 20 miles northeast of the Golans. And I stood there with an Anglican bishop. And Ibid is a camp that's been there ever since 1948, when the UN uh, allowed the Jews to return back to uh, the Middle East, to the, Israel. And these Palestinians have reared generations there in that squalor. And it's hut after hut made out of tin. And the food are, is cooked in open air. Uh, the raw sewage flows right down the middle of this, if you call it a village, right down the middle of this camp. The children are playing in refuse. And their little bloated bellies sticking out and their red hair indicating that their intestines and their liver are being eaten by worms. I wish I hadn't seen that. I remember being in Jeremy, Haiti, just after the her, um, earthquake. And I was standing there in the harbor area in the parking lot, and I was watching this ship come around the point, and it was coming from Port Arthur, filled with human beings. And they were standing front to back like this. And they had been standing like that for 11 hours. Now let your mind race with that one. There were no, they could not go to the potty. 11 hours. And it was 110 degrees. And I remember watching them get off that ship, weak, could barely put one foot in front of the other, holding on to one another, dragging each other across the parking lot. We didn't have enough water. We didn't have enough food. We, had no, we didn't have enough of anything to help them. And I watched them go across the road and into the wooded area where they laid down and died. Hundreds. Hundreds. I wish I hadn't seen that. I remember going to New York early December 2001 after a few days with the United Methodist Women, Women's Curriculum team. Um, we were invited by some NGOs above us, a floor above us, non-governmental organizations, to go to ground zero. And they put us on a shuttle. And they carried us down there and we got off and went in and we stood on a little platformed area and the smoke was still coming out of the holes. And they were telling us different things about the square areas and all this and some of the things that they had been doing. And just as we started to walk off the platform, a bell rang. And we just froze. And we looked back and the firemen were bringing a body out, covered in an American flag. And the bell tolled two more times. And one of the most moving things I have ever heard 
was a trumpet playing Amazing Grace. I mean, we all just squalled right there. I don't care how old we were, how tough we thought we were, we boohooed right there. I wish, I wish I hadn't seen that. A lot of you know that I was a director of EMS services in Union County um, in my younger days, and I saw a lot of things as a paramedic, a lot of terrible things, you know. Death was a daily occurrence. And not only did I see them die, I've, I've held people in my arms and felt them die as well. But I remember one time I was sent to um, my junior high school's principal's home with a police car, and we had to extract him out of the home. And I drove him to Columbia to the detox center. And I remember sitting there beside him on the way down there, this noble man, someone that I had admired and respected so much. He, I could still see a silhouette there in the hallway at Central Junior High School. And I want to tell you something, you didn't want to get paddled by him. It one time did me in. I mean, there was not number two. I got number one. That was it after that. But uh, the, the teachers just loved him because he gave them courage. He, he instilled respect in them. He, he supported them. And, the, and the, the, the students, we loved him too. And there I was sitting beside this broken man, a slave to alcohol. And I wish I had not seen that because I had so much respect for him. Yes, yeah, sometimes blindness serves us well. It protects us. It gives us peace. It ensures our tranquility. And there in Jericho was a blind man sitting at the gate. Jericho was a very popular town. It was a commerce center at this time in the first century. It was the, at the juxtaposition of, of, of trade. A lot of money came through Jericho. And we know from the text that Bartimaeus uh, became blind. There was a time in his life that he could see. He has not been blind all his life. But now he's sitting in the active dust of others, there at the gate of Jericho, trying to wrench existence out of the charity, the pockets, the generous pockets of active people who would go in and out of that gate. Now, maybe like Cynthia Lyles here at First Church, who can hear things 20 miles away. Bartimaeus obviously had some pretty good ears. He had heard that Jesus was coming. And probably he had heard people going in and out of that gate talking about Jesus. He heard about the miracles that Jesus had, had uh, created and done. Uh, from the lame to walk, to the ears that hear, uh, to other blind to see. And Bartimaeus, when he hears that Jesus is coming through that gate, begins to cry out for Jesus to help him. Now the good church people, the disciples, and the Pharisees, the good church people try to hush him. Shh. Don't embarrass Jesus. He doesn't want to mess with you. Hush. And to his credit, Bartimaeus gets even louder. He cries out even more. And he cries out so loud that Jesus hears him crying out. And Jesus tells them to go get him. Bring him here. And they do. And then Jesus asks that ridiculous question. It's the same ridiculous question he asked the man lying beside the pool of Bethesda who had been lying there for three decades, what do you want me to do? Duh. What do you want me to do? Jesus asked Bartimaeus. But maybe it's not a duh question after all. Maybe Jesus is getting to a deeper point with that question. You see, Bartimaeus sitting there in that dust, in that dirt, active dirt of others, the only responsibility he has is to hold up a cup and let people drop something into it. 
But once those eyes are healed, change is going to come in Bartimaeus' life. Severe change. Now he can't just hold up a cup and ask somebody to drop something in it. Now he has to engage. Now he's going to have responsibility. Now he's going to have to do something about his own existence. Maybe that was a great question to ask Barnabas. What do you want me to do? And Barnabas says to his credit, Jesus, I want you to heal me. I want to see. Heal my eyes. And Jesus says to him, and it, it happens, and Jesus says to him, your faith has made you well. Now, blindness was prevalent in the first century. We uh, many children were born blind, and many people became blind over time because of bacteria and, and other things, um, you know, work, a lot of things. We don't know what happened to Barnabas. Uh, we don't know what made him blind. But what we do know is he became well. He became whole. And Mark tells us that Barnabas didn't only get up and drop the cloak and the cup right there at the gate of Jericho, we're told that Mark followed in the way. What does that mean? We well, see, before we were ever called Christians, we were called followers in the way. That was our title, followers in the way. What does that mean? It means followers in the way of Jesus. And what way is that? The way of his attitude, the way of his ministry, the way of his mission, the way of his self-sacrificing, his selflessness in the way to the cross. Barnabas followed him in the way. You know, the great hymn, uh, Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Remember that old song? This text gave that birth. That's where that song came from, from this text. Bartimaeus crying out and receiving healing. It seems to me, at least, that Bartimaeus may have been the only one in the crowd that could really see. You know, there's a difference between physical blindness and spiritual blindness. Bartimaeus could see very well spiritually, although physically blind. The good church people in this story could see physically, but were spiritually blind. Why don't we want to be healed? Why do we want to stay blind? Because healing, healing implies change. Can you be healed and not be changed? No. They go together. Healing goes with change. And we don't like change. Do we? Raise your hand if you love change. Come on. My point exactly. We don't like change. We like to be comfortable. We like to be settled. We like things as they are. The problem is we may not be in a good place. There may be something wrong with where we are, how we are, why we are. We may be in a terrible spiritual place thinking that everything is okay and we need to be healed. But we can't be healed because we don't want to change. Over 30 years ago, I bought a book. I know that's going to amaze you. Um... And I revisit that book often, and I've revisited it so much that it's literally falling apart. The spine is broken and pages are just coming apart. The title of it is, What Prevents Christian Adults from Learning? What Prevents Christian Adults from Learning? And in it, the author suggests it's a constellation of obstructions. The need to be right, the fear of being wrong, the security of the unknown, the pain of 
of uh, unearning the hard work of rethinking, the disturbance of dissonance. Quite a challenging agenda. And as a teacher and author, uh, he worked on that book his entire life. And um, I just found it amazing, and it plays itself out. It has, as I have read that book, that's why I keep revisiting it, because I have seen it so many times in 40 years of ministry. And the interesting thing about the author, John Hull, is he was blind. He was blind. In, in 1779, the English poet and clergyman John Newton, you remember who that is? John Newton? Who is John Newton? Amazing Grace, thank you very much. Amazing Grace, the author of our, our most special hymn, uh, Amazing Grace. He, was, uh, he had a hard life. Some of you have seen the movie, and there's a play out now on Broadway. Um, he had a hard time. 11 years old, um, his father left to go to sail away. He was a, a captain of a ship, and while John was back on the on shore, his mother died. He got passed around from family to family. He ends up on ship with his father. And some terrible things happened to him on board the ship, as you can imagine, as an 11-year-old. And uh, he became very angry and very introverted and uh, became a very profane person. Matter of fact, he, he, was, he became a legend with his profanity. He wrote some very profane things some poetry you would not want to read and you would not be able to get out of your mind's eye after you read it. He was a despicable human being. And he ends up on a slave ship uh, and doing the work of a slave trader and he eventually captains his own slave ship uh, and he meets a fellow who was an atheist who just armed him spiritually. And John Newton says he became an atheist. He didn't believe in God. He just believed in himself. And you can imagine the darkness that captivated him. It just came on him layer upon layer upon layer. He said his eyes were covered with rock. With rock. And how many of you can see through rock? Well, eventually, he, he ends up on a ship, the Greyhound, and that, the Greyhound almost sinks in a storm, very similar to the John Wesley story. He almost sinks on that Greyhound. And uh, there was a fellow on the Greyhound uh, with him who, who had faith and was not afraid of dying. And Newton felt like, uh, he was, like that was unreasonable, and so he struck up a conversation with the fellow, and the fellow told him why. And it was a matter of faith, and he began to talk to Newton about Jesus and, and faith and grace and mercy. And eventually, Newton becomes a Christian. His eyes, he says, were opened. Now think about those great words of amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a... I was once lost, but now am was blind, but now I see. see. Yeah, his eyes, like blind Bartimaeus, had been opened. I'm reminded, in closing, of part of Nelson Mandela's speech where he says, Our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond means. It is our light, not our darkness, that frightens us. So the Bartimaeus incident leaves us with several pressing questions. Are we willing to buck the crowd and critique the conventional? Are we willing to reach out to folk who don't fit and welcome them into our community of faith? Are we willing to recognize that outsiders may actually have more insight about Jesus than we do? That maybe we are uh, spiritually blind 
where we can physically see. Are we willing to throw off our cloaks, the things that protect us and, 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 and hide behind, and fearlessly and faithfully follow the Lord wherever he may lead us in the way? In short, are we willing to be disciples, which in Greek means simply learners? But if you're a learner, then you're being changed. You can't learn something and not be changed. Are we willing to go on learning and go on learning and go on learning even though, mean, even though that means that we're going on cha being changed? We're going to be changed and we're going to be changed. I pray that Jesus will open our eyes so we might indeed Follow him in the way. Amen.